For those of us of a certain age, there is one advertisement you absolutely cannot forget. And that is of Milan Soman and Madhu Sapre in the buff with guess what around their neck. I know that you have to be my age to know the answer to that question. That and the video that catapulted Milan Soman to stardom made in India. But he's the one man who managed to keep his fan following and support base intact down the generations, not just with women and men my age. And that life has now been chronicled in a book named Apli, Made in India, a memoir. Hi, Milan. Hello. That ad. Yes. Well, I was okay. reading in the book, I hadn't realized that just posing in the nude with that, what was it, a python? A python. A python. Eight foot. Would get you into so much trouble. Now, oh, I, do, I didn't remember that it caused, I, I thought it caused a storm because it was the first time you had mainstream models posing in the buff. I didn't realize that it meant threats for Madhu and the ad got pulled and there was all kinds of madness. Yeah. That you didn't know that till today? No, I think I was too young. <laughs> also, the case went on for 40 years, yes. you know, and uh, I mean, yeah, Madhu actually had the, the worst of it. Who filed his case? Uh, well, it was a, it was a PIL. Mm. Um, so so random, by, like Pakistan. Random, but of course, politically motivated. I think at that time, uh, uh, there was a new party in power. Mm. And, uh, you know, there were, maybe people wanted to prove something. I don't know what it was. But there is... Um, there was a specific, uh, what do you call it, uh, thing that they wanted to talk about, which was representation of women. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they picked And up. they said it was obscene. And they it said it was obscene. It was basically obscene representation of women. So if it had been just me naked, it wouldn't matter. That had all, I had already done that anyway. Mm -hmm. in the, with the photograph in the ridge that you had. Yes, yeah, yes. you've seen that. And also, uh, Madhu had uh, done nude uh, uh, shoots. And lots of models had done nude shoots, but for private uh, mm -hmm. you know, books and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Not for uh, an advertisement and not for, say, a newspaper or, anything, or a magazine. Mm -hmm. So that they kind of picked up and said, this, this is not right for the youth to look at. Mm -hmm. So I didn't understand what that meant. But in fact, uh, many years later, there was a documentary that came out uh, that was titled, Milan Soman Made Me Gay. Oh, you have not seen it? I have not seen it. In the title, I'm not in the documentary. But what that, uh, the main protagonist, so it's, a, it's basically about uh, uh, some men talking about when they realized that they were gay. That they were gay. And one of them said that I realized I was gay when I saw this picture. And I was like feeling it for Melinda, not for Madhu. Yes. So I'm saying, so one of the arguments then was not legal arguments, but people were saying that, you know, this is going to subvert uh, our youth and they're going to turn gay because of this picture. They may realize, they're not going to turn. Yeah. You know, that's what I thought. But anyway, people had lots of things to say. But do you think that it was ahead of the curve? Like today, maybe it wouldn't create that kind of stir. You think so? I it don't know. I, don't, I, I actually, I don't know. I don't know. Anything can create a yeah, controversy. This is true. Whatever this is you true. want, this is true. you can create a controversy. We live in the age of social media. This Absolutely. was pre the age of social media. It was. How, how, like, how, how hellish was it? Like, you can look back and laugh at it. And you have a reasonably sort of laconic tone in recounting well, it in the book. Well, like I said, not for me, but for Madhu, it was really bad. There were women's groups who were burning saris in front of her house. Her, her passport was... Uh, uh, was blocked. Uh, she had to take permission from the court to, to leave the country and so on. Mm -hmm. For me, there was nothing, mm -hmm. you know, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. Not that I wanted it, but, but that it was, it was all targeted it was on all the woman. Targeted to her. That lasted for quite some time. In fact, uh, everybody that I just spoke to personally when I met them, they, they said that, you know, we really like the picture. My mother loved the picture. She wasn't in the country when we shot it. Mm -hmm. And she saw it in a publication that was an international publication, mm. an Indian one that was uh, released abroad. So that wasn't banned. And she called me. She didn't know about the whole thing happening. And she said that, oh, I just saw an ad of yours. Mm. And I said, OK, what did you think of it? She said, oh, it's a beautiful picture. You know? So it was definitely motivated by a few people. Mm. Now, this book, which is a book of, of your life, it's kind of told in this very easygoing, almost laconic style where you're almost surprised that anyone's interested. Oh yeah, you're interested in my story. Me and Melinda, I had a regular life. Like that's, that's kind of the tone, that's yeah. kind of the tone in the book. But there are little nuggets that one didn't know about you. For example, you were enrolled in an RSS Shaka. I knew you were going to ask me. Of course I were going to ask you. <laughs> and, and you make it sound like it was like an extension of sports day at school. It was. It so really talk, was. So talk a little bit about that. that so, how you can't reconcile the deeply politicized conversation yeah, around the yeah. RSS with your own experience. Yes. 
Yeah. I can't reconcile it, but I understand it. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So at that time, uh, I think f- f- the place where I grew up, which was Shivaji Park in uh, Bombay, a very um, middle class Hindu Marathi Maharashtrian neighborhood, a lot of the kids were enrolled in the RSS. Even my father was when he was a kid. So uh, the enrollment was was not to actually bring us up in terms of some political ideology. But just to make sure that we had the discipline as children, you know, we learned about discipline, we learned about sports. But did your father have a political slash? Not at all. We may be Hindutva ideology. Not at all, not no. at all. I mean, he had this pride about being a Hindu, of course. Uh, I don't see anything about it. I'm proud to be an Indian. As you have a sentence in there where you said that I don't see any reason to be overly proud about it. I don't see any reason to be embarrassed exactly. about it. I see nice things and bad things in, in every religion. I see nice things and bad things in every group, in every clan, in every society. And so uh, for me, it is, it's up to me to pick up the good things. So how old are you when you're at the Shaka? I must have been about uh, 9 or 10. And how long do you stay in Until I was 11. Probably. And do the kids ever have a conversation? Like an undercover agent. <laughs> <laughs> no, how I'm long just, were you in No, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> you know, what did they I'm ask nine you? years old enough yeah. to say, okay, what is the Shaka? What is yes. the RSS? So I'm sure you kids had those so conversations. So I'll tell you exactly how it was. So it, there, was a, there was a kind of uh, uh, meeting at, mm-hmm. uh, in the evening at about 6 o'clock where we would all salute the flag. And after that, we would play games. Because there was no um, lecture or any kind of discussion or debate or anything like that. Uh, it was just games, right? And then we would go to camps. I'd been to two or three camps that they had where there were thousands of children together. And there, there would be addresses. But the addresses were basically on how to be a model citizen. And that, again, had nothing to do with racism or politics or anything like that. Like what? A model citizen would do like you should respect your elders and you should pick up garbage and you know stuff like it's that. Like a moral science class yes. in school. And then you must be um, self-dependent, independent, um, those kind of things, which are, uh, definitely I believe in completely. So when you grew older and yes. perhaps started reading about the RSS yes. and and politics yes. and and were exposed to all of that, yes. did you look back at your time at that shaka differently? No, it was what it was. I mean, that's what, that's all it was. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it very much. And in fact, even the people that I met, the older people who were there to take care of the children, they were all really, really nice people. And uh, in fact, through generations, like I know the, the people that I would look up to over there and who were, who were kind of taking care of those um, shakhas and all of that, they, their parents were friends with my parents. Mm. And they were all had, had a kind of... Uh, uh, history with the RSS, mm. and they were all really nice. Now, you spoke. I, I think that it got political down the line, maybe, mm. because I don't think at that time I noticed anything. Or maybe, or even my father mentioned anything, or yeah, his it, friends mentioned it. That's what I was going to ask you. There are yeah. conversations around the dining table no, at home. Not at all. When they no. were about the shaka, there was no politics coupled with it at not all. Not at all. And I think as a, I was, I've always been quite aware of what's happening around me, and I didn't see any of that. So today, when you read. You know, the fierce debate supporters and critics yes. of the RSS both equally vocal. Yes. Uh, I think it's, it's possible that the RSS has become more political. Hmm. I think so. I think maybe not at that time. And um, they may have had political interests and they may, may have had uh, parties that were representing them in politics. But I don't think that they themselves hmm. were political at all. And that, that's what I saw reflected in the activities that we did. Now, talking about your father, that's the one sort of troubled, angsted Yes. relationship you talk yes. about never really being able to make a connection yeah uh, and then uh, you know and then he passes he dies yes. and then in, in in a way that's when the floodgates really open for you or what 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 happens like talk a little bit about why you see that relationship as so troubled or maybe the word is inarticulated while he was alive well i think it was the relationship was troubled because he was troubled mm. you know so i think uh, as a family uh, each of the individuals was quite well balanced. So I have three sisters and uh, of course my mother and all of us have managed um, our lives quite well and we're very, very happy in the positions that we are. But he unfortunately had uh, a disease. He had the diabetes from the age of 22 and also he had the heart problem. So brought on by many, many years of diabetes. He had all, all the problems and complications that are associated with that. And that of course affected the way he saw life and the way he responded to situations at home, at work, I mean, everywhere. 
So that was uh, an enormous relationship. So he was a little unpredictable. Like so he I was said moody. In the book that I, he was I moody. Know, he was very, very moody. And I know that he was, uh, he obviously loved his family very much. And we could see that uh, from time to time. But at some time he was um, withdrawn and he was uh, very cynical about stuff, which we weren't, mm. you know, especially when we were young. I mean, when you're that young, you're not yeah. cynical at all. So it was difficult to understand uh, his point of view when he said, you know, this, these, these things are not right and these things are... Uh, what did you disagree on? Um, Everything? I think I mentioned it in the book as well that, you know, he had a lot of theories that I would be discriminated against because... So in this, there was a little bit of, uh, of uh, you could call it racism uh, or, or dogmatism that, he, that because I was a Brahmin, I would be, uh, you know, discriminated against. And I didn't see that. And I still don't. Uh, I just think I'm privileged, which, which is actually the truth. And um, whatever happened to me, especially in swimming, because he said, you know, even in swimming, you won't be allowed to, to do your best. And of course, that is what happened, but I don't think it's because of what he was so, saying. So, so let's actually get to that yeah. moment in the book, because that's the one moment in the book where I think it left a scar on you. Mm. And, and it's, it's something I mean, that's obviously I would stayed say alive. Talking a lot. So, so let's just put this into context for people who don't know what we're talking about. Sure. So you're expecting to be selected for the Asian Games. Yes, 1986. And, and you basically go and piss off the Indian coach because yeah. you're nicer to the foreign coach and yeah. you're clearly taking a side. The Indian coach's ego is hurt yeah. and you don't, get, uh, you don't get picked up. And then when you ask why, they say your stroke is bad. And you obviously know that that's a made up ex post yeah. facto excuse. Yeah. Now, what's going through you? Because you you keep alluding to your temper. Yeah. But you're young at this point. Yeah. There's a hierarchy of power here. Maybe you can't really show your rage. So how do you process I this moment? I didn't know that. And so what happens? So what happens? What do you do? What happens exactly? So, I mean, I was um, idealistic as any person my age would be, I think. And I said that, I said that if I am right, then um, good things should happen. Did you want Not to be a professional thing. sports person? Not a professional sports person, but when you have trained um, all your life till that point. So I started swimming at the national level at the age of nine. And I won my first national level at the age of nine or ten. And then you are constantly swimming at that level of competition for almost 13 or 14 years. And um, like I was swimming 65 kilometers a week at the time that I stopped swimming. 65 kilometers a week. I don't even run that much today, right? So it was, it was a lot of hard work. And when you are putting in that much effort, you do expect to get where you want to get, mm -hmm. right? And I would have gotten where I wanted to get if I was allowed to through my own effort, but I was not allowed to. So obviously that was really agonizing. Yeah. And through no fault of my own, except that I did not understand the politics or the egos mm -hmm. that were involved. And it was just so, and there was nobody there to, to tell me. What did it teach you about how sports is managed in our country? There's this whole debate about politics. Uh, politicians. We don't need to be taught, we can see it. <laughs> no, but I'm saying there's, you know, politicians but, are sitting on all of our sporting federations. Yes, yes. And this is not about party A or party B, it's happened under every party. Yeah, of course. And the thing is, I, I can see that it's, it is better now. It was really, really bad then. It is better now, but obviously nowhere close to what it is in the, in the nations where sports is really respected. Are we a country that respects sport? No, not at all. Not at all. And where as do you a country, we as a, as a But there are, of course, certain people who, for whom sports is everything. But as a country, no, we don't. Not yet. I can see we are moving into that direction, but not yet. Would your life, you think, have gone in a completely different direction had you gone for the Asian Games? No. I would, I would not have added Would you still have been... Book. <laughs> Would you still have been Milit Soman, you know, the, the model with Madhu Sapre, the, the yes. you know, would yes. you have still been? Yes, yes. I can't say that in it the space of entertainment life. and I can't say it changed my life in that way because everything that has happened to me has happened by chance. But you, you, you don't think sport was your first love? It still is. Yes, but I mean professionally, as a, as a career choice, as a professional no. choice. I mean, uh, people always ask me after every 
kind of career move that I have made. Like after swimming, people said that, you know, why don't you become a coach? Because you know so much about swimming and sports mm. and fitness and blah. And I said, no, but I'm not interested in being a coach. Then after I stopped modeling, which was in 1995, they said, why don't you uh, continue in fashion and do, um, you know, start your own line or become a choreographer or start an academy? I said, but I don't want to. Mm. I want to move on to something else, which I, which I did. I started television. Mm -hmm. You know, so whatever I have done has not, I think, been dictated by what has happened in the past. It has always been dictated by the opportunities that I see in the future. Now, you've had this sort of, not just ringside view, but you've lived this high society, high life, which yeah. you talk about, right? You talk about the drugs, the alcohol, uh, the women. Uh, well, how drugs, does, alcohol and women. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, that's as cliched yes. as it yes. gets, it by is, the way, right? It is. Uh, my question to you is, because you've written about it very casually. Yeah. Was it really as much of a non-event uh, as the tone you strike when you write about it? Right, uh, because you say one of the arguments that you make is that it didn't really transform you or hit you in any hard way, which is why you were able to leave it when you needed to. Yes. Was it's it that true. simple? Yes. Was it that simple? Unfortunately, yes. Otherwise, I'd have more to write about. Yeah. But I think what what really worked for me was my years in sport, mm -hmm. which really gave me an awareness of what discipline really means and what is important to me what I prioritize in my life, which is the way, I, which, the way I feel, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And I, I, I hold on to that. Mm -hmm. you know, it is, it's something that I'm really, um, I won't say passionate about, but I really think is important for me. So any experience that I have in my life, any opportunity that I have in my life is only second to that. Mm -hmm. That how is this going to affect me? It's there. It's not that I consciously think about it, but is this going to affect my peace of mind? Yeah. You know, yeah. I have to hold on to that. Whatever it is, it could be drugs, it could be women, it could be marriage, it could be whatever. I have to hold on to my peace of mind. But you're this fitness icon today, right? Yeah. Uh, and there are young people. No, yes. wait, yes. Let, me, let me ask yes. a question. Yes. Yes. There, there are young people who follow you who yeah. are like, what, you weigh the same that you did when you were 19? You work on it. The, the marathon running... No, actually, people who are 60 are shocked about it. But the, 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 mar the, mar the marathon running is, is a constant sort of narrative trope in, in, in the book. My question is something different. My question is, someone who cares that much about being fit and healthy, yeah. uh, how are you so simultaneously laconic about the drugs and the drinking, the knocking back, the, the, what used to... There's a new club and... For every guest that enters, you're, you're doing a vodka shot. Now, it's funny when you recount it, but like this isn't what we, we want kids to be doing, right? Yes. yes. No. Espe I'll especially tell, the tell, drugs. I'll, especially I'll, the drugs. I'll, I'll tell you two things. One is that a lot of people, when they come to me, people in the media, for example, and they say, what is your advice to youth? I say, I have no advice. You're go, basically saying go make your own mistakes. Go and make your own mistakes. You must. You have to make your own mistakes. So do you think that phase in your life was a mistake? No, I don't. Because you didn't become an addict. Exactly. But you could have. I could have. But anything can happen to anybody. So you have to be sure about what you want in life. That is, like I said, all through this journey, right from my childhood, I've held on to the fact that I want to be healthy mm -hmm. in my body and in my mind. Mm -hmm. That is something that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. So I know the drugs are bad. So I could experience it, but I will make sure that it doesn't affect me negatively. But you know it's the risk. risk. But you know it that addicts risk. are born from that belief that I can control this, and it's an it's a inaccurate I, belief. Of course, of course right? it is. But with me, it was true. Therefore, what would you say today, looking back at that? Day? I would say that this is a mistake. I would say even cigarettes. I've yeah. said, in fact, in the book, I've said that to, cigarette smoking was the stupidest thing I ever did. Yeah. Not drugs. Yeah. Cigarette smoking. The stupidest thing I ever did, because I did that the most consistently and for the longest time, almost seven or eight years, I was smoking 30 cigarettes a day. And I don't know how that has actually affected me. I still don't feel it even today, but I'm sure it has. So every mistake we make, the, the, the extent of the mistake is that you are going to pay for it. Yeah. However small it is, you will pay for it. I believe in karma. Yeah, yeah. it is. There's a karma justice. You might, okay, you might pay for it in a small way. You might pay for it in a big way. That again depends on you. So... I, I think I would agree with you on that, but my question is now going to be a little different. How did you, and was it important to you to remain grounded, living this life of under the arc lights? Yeah. Uh, a huge amount of female attention, a huge amount of random public attention. Yes. 
how important was it for you to remain with feet firmly on the ground and who kept you real or what kept you real so i was i i've always been very shy you know every this is like every celebrity comes and says this. Yeah, actually i'm very shy but, but it's true i am so i was never, i don't have pictures of myself mm. i ne- i was never photographed uh, as a child either I used which to is that. ironic right which is ironic and even today i say okay you want to take pictures of me you have to pay me yeah no pictures otherwise yeah. If people come to take a selfie with me, they have to do push-ups. Nothing is free. Don't be silly. I have, I have all these my my producers waiting to take a selfie with you. Please don't get into push-ups now. I never now. refuse, but only if they do push-ups. I mean, that, that's are you thing. serious? Absolutely. Everybody, whoever it could be, it could be a collector. If he's in plain clothes, it could be a commissioner. I don't want a selfie with you. I am doing no push-ups. Yes. That's I'm it. joking. Okay. No, no, we'll carry on. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. No selfies were so, so for push-ups. Me, it was always. I was never. I was never in search of fame. Uh, I was never in search. Of, so when I'm saying I'm shy, there could be. You could be shy, but you really want to be out there. Sure. Like yeah. you're fighting that shyness because you yeah. want to be an actor. Yeah. You want to be in the archives. You want to be famous. You want to be successful and rich and all those things. I never wanted any of that, and that's why I never pursued a film career. Well, you also left Jo Jita Vai Sikandar because they didn't feed you. Me. This is the funniest story in this book. Is it? I found it very funny. I mean, you left, you walked out of the movie a because they didn't give you enough food. Yeah, I threw my cycle. Yes, you had a tantrum. Where is my breakfast? <laughs> you, and they were offering you bags of biriyani, and you were like, "What the hell is no, going they didn't on?" Offer me bags. They offered me nothing. That oh, was what was the? What, so we said we'll come back is. to this. It is but it's the filmy culture. Ki baad mein kahin. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And you okay, actually so left. Okay. You yeah. actually left a movie because there wasn't khana on the set. Yeah, because it wasn't at that time important to me at all. What was important to me, as I've said earlier, is I should be happy doing what I'm doing. And if I'm not, then it doesn't work. So did you what regret? Did you is. regret walking out of that movie when you saw what a super hit it became? No, I loved the film. Yeah. I didn't regret it because I, I. It was not that I thought, oh, I have to do another film after this. But but the singular reason for leaving it was because there was no food on set. Yeah, it was. I, I enjoyed. You myself. could have just taken different from home. I really, in, I was not at home. If I was, I would have taken different from home. Yes. I was in Kodai Canal or Roti or somewhere, mm-hmm. and uh, I was at the mercy of uh, the production. Okay, but come back to my question. What kept you real? So you were shy. Then so you have all this because attention. Because I never wanted it. Uh, I never chased it. Uh, it was just that I want to experience this. Let me see what's going to happen. So I al- always had a boundary that I'm not going to go beyond this. That's why I, I said. I'm not going to do films. I'll do Georgita Vai Sikandar. That's it, you know. So everything I do, even if you see the marathon, I when I, I when I started running, I didn't like running. I had this concept in my head that a marathon is something that I must do once in my life, like a, a rite of passage for a man. If you don't run a marathon at least once in your life, you're not a man. I had that since I was a child. So when the Mumbai marathon was announced, I said I have to do at least one. I'll just do one, and that's it. But I got hooked to it, and like how. And now your mother. I mean, your mother. The shots of your mother running with you in her sari. Yeah. Yeah. How does she? Can you tell that. me? I I still don't know how to tie a sari, so I can't even imagine someone who runs in one. Okay. So we do competitions now at running events that we organize yeah. on how quickly you can tie a sari and run in it. And you know how much time they take? Um, Twenty seconds. Okay, I'm ashamed. No, come and learn. Yeah, I might take you. Twenty seconds, and then they run. How did you get your mom to start running? Or was she I always didn't. sporty? I didn't. She was not sporty, but she was fit. See, for me, what I was going to tell you about fitness is that why what keeps me grounded is that my understanding of fitness is not about running. It's not about how fast, how far. It's not about lifting weights. It's about how you deal with life. If you can be positive in any situation, learn from every experience, that determines how fit you are. If you can create a positive environment around you for yourself and for other people to achieve the larger goal, that determines how. How old was she when she started running? She again? was sixty when she started trekking. So she was. Like, a, she's a biochemist. She was a teacher, professor of biochemistry. She started. Uh, she she said that when I when I retire, I want to trek. Mm-hmm. Uh, so at sixty, she started trekking, and she still treks. She's eighty-one. Yeah. Uh, year before last, we went on a hike for three hundred and fifty kilometers over twenty days. She did that. So she's super fit, you know. And it starts in the mind. It not starts. It's only in the mind. Our body is like capable of insane things. But do you think your 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 passion for fitness was triggered in a way by seeing your father? And all the ailments the that he battled, how they changed him? Yes, it's possible. Like the only thing that I 
Um, I won't say I'm afraid of, but I'm wary of, that I'm concerned about is sickness. Is about being sick. It's not about being old, because again, that's a concept. And uh, it's it's about it's about pain. I, I don't. Nobody likes it. Mm. But I make every effort to elude it. Sickness and pain. I don't want it. If I if I die tomorrow, I'll be really happy. I'm I'm super fit. I'm super happy. I'm die tomorrow. Not that I want to die. But if I die, it's it's fine. Now you say you're shy. You didn't seek fame. It kind of just all happened. But you are now that person who. And you've been for many years, whose life plays out in the public domain, right? Yes. So let's first start at that Made in India moment, the name of the yes. book, but also the video that you found tacky. And you were in it for what, 53 seconds or 51 seconds? I was going to call this book 53 seconds. Yeah, 53 seconds, right? <laughs> yeah. So you're looking at this sort of kitschy video and you're saying, what the hell is this? Yeah. And then I'll tell you all models at that time. Yeah. None of them wanted to be in films. Okay, one or two, Rahul Roy, for example. It was because we we were seeing, you know, especially in the late 80s, Madhuri Dixit, mm-hmm. Kachma Kapoor in their earlier avatars with the frills and curls. And we're like, no way can we be part of that? You know, it's it's ridiculous. And we wanted to stay as far away from it as possible because models thought and including... You thought you were cool. Oh, much, much. I mean, cool starts with us. Yeah, so so that's what it was at that time. Today, of course, it's different. Yeah. Everybody has a stylist. But... Um, yeah, do you all, like, what's with that, by the way? That everyone has a style? No, I just, like, sometimes spend, <laughs> I'm, like, looking at Instagram and I'm, like, feel sorry for you guys because it's, like, no one in the public eye seems to be able to leave home without a stylist and a photograph. I don't know why. You know, do, you, do you have to do that as well? No. See, what am I wearing? I'm wearing track pants, rubber chuppers. And, uh, in fact, everyone tells me this, that you must dress better. And I say, why? They've stopped telling me color my hair hmm. because I've, I've said why too many times. Yeah. And now they say you have to dress better, and I say, what for? I mean, why should I? But come back to Made in India. So, yeah. so you were the cool guys. You didn't want to be actors. We never wanted to be. Uh, yeah. What was the question? Play, living out of the public domain, life playing out of the public domain. But we started with that video that you found tacky. Yeah. yeah. And then but the video. But then the video it was, it was, does way better than you would ever but imagine. So do, films. so do films. I mean, I've seen films that to me like are horrifying. And they do really well. The public loves How did them. that video change your life? <clears throat> oh. The music video. It was the music video age, right? Yes. So, yeah. Well, again, not much per se. Because when I did the music video, I, that was the year I stopped modeling. Mm. So I was already at the peak of my modeling career. Mm. I stopped modeling in that year. I started doing television, which was with a mouthful yeah. of sky in 1995. So, of course, the, and the video became popular very fast. And it continued to be popular. So, of course, more and more people then began, began to know who I was. Because as a model, I think my, my fame or, or, or was restricted to a certain set mm. of people. Mm. People in fashion, people who... And this kind of... There was no social media then, there were no magazines, there was, no, yeah. there was nothing, right? Yeah. There was no radio, there was no TV. There was only Doodarshan and so on. And MTV was one of the first channels yeah. that came in. Yeah. So, it didn't really alter my life that much. But I can see, since then, till now... There's been a huge graph, yeah. you know. I mean, today, people who were two years old when it was released come to me and say, oh, we saw this music video. video. And, and today, and, and then I go back to the music video. As long as they're not calling you uncle. Are they calling you uncle? Nobody calls me uncle. But that's just like your good looks. Yes. That saves you. Right? Yeah. But let me, let me ask you how it feels for a shy person yeah. to have personal choices debated in public. So you go and get married yeah. and you, there's a chapter on you know, how you meet your wife. Uh, and it's a sweet story, but yeah. she's 26 years younger and mm-hmm. everybody has an opinion. And there's a line in this book and you say, you know, I'm, I'm not actually predatory and you may want to slot me. Yes, as yeah, I'm not predatory. Yeah, yeah, you say the one thing that I'm... You, I the, the, what I remember of the book is that you're basically saying that you know, when I've been in relationships, I've stayed committed to them. When I've between relationships, I've done what I wanted to, but I've tried to be, you know, I'm not this cliched philandering man that you may imagine me to be. Then you go and get married and there's a much younger person. There is. And everybody has an opinion on they it. They do. And how do you deal with that? And how I, I do you say people's that? opinions? Okay. I do, completely. Okay. The fact is that till the age of 27, all my girlfriends were older than me. Hmm. Right? I, I had How much older? Because years. that's what I was going to ask. Like, I have no problem with age as long as women can date younger men. But the way women get grief for dating younger men, yeah. men don't get that grief for dating younger women. But now I'm talking about and that. And that's time. the hypocrisy, is, right? 30 years ago. 10 years, 15 years, my senior. Okay. And uh, 
Madhu was the first girlfriend that I had who was younger than me. Okay. And then since then they've been younger. And okay. Younger. And but, but, but really, the point about age sometimes is to make a point about power. I'm not talking yeah. about you particularly. Sure. But I'm the sure. general debate is that there's this cliche of older men with younger women. Yes. Because there's a power equation yes. there. The moment you reverse it, yes. society doesn't accept it. So and that's why it gets discussed. Yes. So I don't know what it is with me, and maybe this is true for other people also, is that as I grew older, and when I was meeting people, I found that people my age had a, a lot of baggage. Hmm. And maybe sometimes too much for me. Hmm. I couldn't take other people's baggage. I mean, I've got my own, right? And I found that younger people, so I'm not just saying women, younger people had less. Hmm. And they were more exciting in terms of their attitudes. Less jaded. Ideas, less jaded and fresh. And that is something that's attractive for me. So. That comes with a younger age, I guess. But you can be that way even at an older age, yeah. like me. Mm -hmm. You can remain that way, but it takes an effort. Like Henry Ford, for example, the former president said, <coughs> you can be old at 25 and young at 80. Sure. It's in your mind. Sure. So generally when you meet people, as they grow older, they, they kind of collect. They don't, they're not able to release the things that they carry around. Mm -hmm. And that is not so exciting if you want to spend a lot of time with somebody. So I found it attractive as I grew older that I would keep meeting younger people. I would be attracted to younger people. Mm. It was, for me, it was not about power. I always felt more powerful than anybody, even if they're older than me, younger than me, or whoever it was. So when, when everybody and their pop had an opinion on your marriage or yes. your relationship, yeah. uh, did you just laugh it off? Did it get to you at some oh, point? Never. Never. Has what people say ever mattered? Never. Never ever. Unless, unless it actually interfered with what I wanted. Has that happened? Like if I was physically stopped from marrying Ankita, it would have mattered, but nobody could Like if it could alter the course alter of your the decision. Alter the course of what I wanted to do. Like for example, it mattered that I was not allowed to swim in the 1986 Asian Games. At that point, it, that's the only thing that has ever happened to me that has stopped me from doing what I wanted. The reason why it's stuck in my head is that. Okay, so I want to end with that because that is in fact... I mean, I think that it dominates or it casts a shadow over your, yeah, it does, it your life and yeah, your story, yeah. right? Um, what stands between us and genuinely being a sporting culture, of a, a, a country that understands fitness? And I'll just give you a couple of my thoughts. I think the absence of space, spaces, yes. really matters. You know, you live in Delhi where half the time you can't go out because you can't breathe. Yeah. Right? Uh, though we have a lot of parks. Now, maybe yeah. that's an excuse, but I'm saying when I travel outside, yeah. just the geography of a place can make a difference. It it's not just about politics and our sporting it is. So there so are many managed. things, there are many things, but I think the main thing is public will. Mm -hmm. You know, if people want it, we live in a democracy. If people want it, it will happen. If the majority of people want it, it will happen. What do you find? So do if people you want ask it? me what stands between us mm -hmm. and sporting greatness, I would say it's time. We have the talent. Once we develop the desire to do it in large enough numbers, we will rule the world. Are you carrying a dream with you that you haven't realized? Um, no. But see, dreams, I dream every day, you know, so things. I mean, up. may we all have your life, yeah. Thank you, William. Yeah. Pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you.